Hello, welcome to Morning Manna, May the 23rd, 2021. Let us pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can continue our study today. We're grateful for all that you have done for us in the past and how you have shown us the way to go. We ask that you would fill us with understanding that our lives might be completely drawn to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today we continue to take a look at the rise of the Antichrist, part two. That would be the rise of the Antichrist, part two. And as I said before, today's date is May the 23rd, 2021. All right, so let's get started here. Now, Daniel chapter seven, verses one through seven, describes a dream that was given to Daniel of four beasts that came up from the sea. Now, these four beasts represented the same four kingdoms described in Daniel chapter 2. And if we read from Daniel chapter 7, beginning at verse 4, it says this, The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Verse 5 says, And behold, another beast, the second, like to a beer, and it raised itself up on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. And then verse 6 says, And after this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon its back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. So now, those are three of the beasts that we notice there between Daniel chapter 7, verses 4, all the way through to Daniel chapter 6. Now we come to the fourth beast. And of course, that fourth beast represents Rome. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7 says, after this I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. So now we're dealing with this fourth beast that represents Rome. And it is diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So I would imagine that the first question you would ask is, well, but then what were these ten horns? Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8 describes it. It says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn there were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So now apparently, these ten horns represents the, the kind of kingdoms that existed once the fourth kingdom was destroyed. That's pretty clear. After a while, this fourth kingdom lost its dominant position in the world and was split up into ten separate kingdoms. All right? And uh, of course, then uh, notice also what it says here in, in verse 8, that of the, those ten horns into which it was split up, there came up a little horn that was small, but it was really powerful because it caused three of those original ten to be plucked up. Now, what is said of the little horn as compared with the ten horns of the fourth beast of Daniel 7? Verse 24 says of Daniel chapter 7, He shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. So now this is powerful. And of course, I'm sure that you're aware of this by now. Um, the the ten horns that came up out of ultimately out of that fourth beast, which we know to be Rome, the papacy, the Roman kingdom, that 
four, those ten horns turned out to be what we today know to be Europe. Um, you know, split up into ten kingdoms. Ten separate, separate kingdoms. And the interesting thing about that is that uh, you and I, as we look th through all of the history of this world, we realize that everything that God has said, everything that he said, nothing, let me put it in another way, nothing that God has said has ever not come to pass. Exactly what he has said, always in the way that he has said it, it has always come to pass. And notice here that what is being described here is this powerful little horn that comes up. And it is really something fantastic about that horn because when you look at it and you compare it with all of the other things that we've seen happening prior to that, then we know indeed that it was a tremendous fulfillment of all that God said would come to pass. So first of all, we take a look at the, the fourth beast, which is Rome, Roman kingdom. And we see that it, uh, it is split up into 10 kings or 10 kingdoms. And that is, uh, something that is so important that you understand. And then you begin to understand how come it is, how it is, why it is, how it is. Today our lives are filled with joy as we look at the Word of God and, and how clearly uh, God has told us in advance all the things that we have seen coming to pass. It has always been that way. God's Word has always been fulfilled exactly the way that He wants it to be fulfilled. And He warns us in advance so that we will not lose any time or any opportunity to be ready for the time to come. Now that fourth beast that we were talking about, which had ten horns um, and is described as ten kings that shall arise, were the Franks, the Alemanni, the Lombards, the Suevi, the Anglo-Saxons, the Burgundians, the Visigoths, the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. And of course, we studied those those kingdoms, those ten kingdoms, in our very last session yesterday, on May the twenty second, two thousand and twenty one. And um, you need to go back and take a look at that. Take take a listen to that again, and you will see exactly what it is God is saying here. All right. So, what is said of the little horn as compared with the ten horns of the fourth beast of Daniel seven? He shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And of course, it is pretty obvious, the three kings that were um, removed were the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Othrogoths. We studied that in our last session also. So go back and take a look at it. All right, you, you will find it, take a listen to it again, and you will find it very um, informative. All right. Now the, the papacy which arose on the ruins of the Roman Empire differed from all previous forms of Roman power in that it was an unreligious tyranny claiming universal dominion over both spiritual and temporal officials, especially the former. It was a union of church and state with the church dominant and in complete control. So that's the difference, and that is why that little horn was diverse from all the first. It wasn't just one of those kingdoms that we mentioned just now, but it covered just it covered the state and the church together. So what rivalry was the papacy represented by the little horn to assume towards the most high? What was that rivalry? Daniel chapter seven and verse twenty five says, And if he shall speak great words against the Most High. It means, therefore, that that little horn that came up that was so different from the other kingdoms began to speak great words against the Most High God. Question. How does Paul, speaking of the man of sin, describe this same power? 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4 says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is as God, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now that is something. So this little horn that we're talking about today, that comes up out of the ten horns that are represented by what we not know today to be Europe, which removes ten, I mean three of the ten kingdoms. But now he's not just a political uh, power, he is a, a combination of church and state, and he controls everything, all of society together. And he not only does he speak great things against the most high God, but he also opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, says Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4, so that he is as God sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now that's tremendous. That is incredibly powerful. And that is what this particular power has been doing ever since he has come up. Now, I've got here a, 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 a record of a number of statements, most of them by Roman Catholic writers, which will indicate to what extent the papacy has actually done this, placed himself in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Let's begin, and, and, and I'm sure that we won't get finished today because there's so much more. But first of all, let's take a look at Bellarmine in his book on the authority of councils, chapter 17. He says this about the papacy. All the names which are attributed to Christ in scripture, implying his supremacy over the church, are also attributed to the Pope. Now that is what Bellarmine wrote in his book on the authority of councils. And, and that is in chapter 17, he writes that. Christopher Marcellus, in the fourth session of the Fifth Lateran Council, uh, and which was published in 1672, says this, For thou art the shepherd, thou art the physician, thou art the director, thou art the husbandman, finally thou art another god on earth. Wow. That's... uh. Christopher Marcellus in the fourth session of the Fifth Lateran Council. And uh, you, you'll find that record found in the History of the Councils, published in 1672. Then there's Leonard Woolsey Bacon. That's right, Bacon. He says this in the American Tract Society edition, page 220. Quote, the Pope is the supreme judge of the law of the land. He is the vice-regent of Christ, who is not only a priest forever, but also king of kings and lord of lords. Wow. That's Leonard Woolsey Bacon. And he's saying that uh, on, it was published on March the 18th, 1871. It was quoted in the Vatican Council. And, and it was quoted by Leonard Woolsey Bacon. And, of course, it was published in the American Tract Society on page 220. But that's not all. <clears throat> Goss, in his book on the authority and obedience, in chapter 1, says the following. Christ entrusted his office to the chief pontiff, but all power in heaven and in earth has been given to Christ. Therefore, the chief pontiff who is his vicar, will have this power also. And that is Gloss in his book on authority and obedience in chapter 1. And he says that uh, it was published in volume 3. Now, th now this is tremendous. These men are saying this thing about the Pope, giving to the Pope the power of God and claiming that he is Christ. He is Christ. Pharasis um, in volume 6 on page 26 in his article entitled Papa or the Pope says hence the Pope is crowned with a triple crown as king of heaven and earth and purgatory now that's Ferasis and he's publishing that of course 
in Volume 6 on page 26 of the article Papa. Let me give you one more. <clears throat> the writings of Augustinus de Aconda says, and he says this in, um, in his book on an appeal from the decision of the Pope, he says this, the decision of the Pope and the decision of God constitute one decision, just as the opinion of the Pope and the disciples are the same. Now that was written by Augustinus de Aconda, and it was printed in that book on an appeal from the decision of the Pope. So notice that all of these men are paying allegiance to the papacy, paying allegiance to the Pope, exactly as the text that we read says, he is in the, in the temple of God, taking upon himself the name of God and the authority of God. I mean, it blows you away when you think of the number of people, the number of men, the number of priests, the number of leaders of churches who have embraced that kind of thinking where the papacy is concerned. Perhaps I should give you a few more. How about that? Henry Edward Manning, Archbishop of Westminster, says this, All the faithful of Christ must believe that the Holy Apostolic See and the Pontiff possesses the primacy over the whole world, and that the Roman Pontiff is the successor of the Blessed Peter, Prince of the Apostles, and is true Vicar of Christ, and the head of the whole Church, and father and teacher of all Christians, and that full power was given him in the Blessed Peter to rule, to feed, and to govern the universal Church of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now that is some serious stuff. That was written by Henry Edward Manning. Henry Edward Manning, Archbishop of Westminster. And of course, it was published in 1871 in um, that journal that he wrote, The Vatican Council and Its Definitions, on page 214. Also, Henry Edward Manning wrote the following on page 218 of the same journal. We teach and define that it is a dogma divinely revealed that the Roman pontiff, when the, when he speaks ex, ex cathedra, that is, when in the discharge of the office of the pastor and the doctor of all Christians, by virtue of his supreme apostolic authority, he defines the doctrine regarding faith or morals to be held by the universal church, by the divine assistance promised to him in blessed Peter is possessed of that infallibility with which the divine Redeemer willed that his church should be endowed with the defining doctrine regarding faith and morals and that therein such definitions of the Roman pontiff are irreformable of themselves and not from the consent of the church. In other words, he's all powerful. Can't change anything he says. As Henry Edward Manning now you gotta understand that these men were leading in the church at the time. And, and, and this, these are the things that they're teaching these people. And the people embracing it. So now you, you, you realize the significance of what is happening here. This, this, this text, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 4, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. All of those statements validate the fulfillment of that text and showing that all of these men got together and began to teach the people who are sitting in their pews this error concerning this man. The Reverend P. Millet in his book Jesus living in the priest says this, Should Jesus Christ come in person from heaven into a church to administer the sacrament of reconciliation? And should he say to a penitent, I absolve thee? And should a priest sitting at his side in the tribunal of penance pronounce over a penitent the same words, I absolve thee? There is no question that in the latter case, as in the former, the penitent would be equally loosed from his sin by both. Lord have mercy. So the priest has the ability to absolve sin. 
That's the Reverend P. Millett. These are the men who were given the authority to stand in the pulpit and to preach the gospel, or at least what they call the gospel, to these people. Now, I want you to understand something of great significance here this this morning. The, the, the Roman church that I'm describing, the papacy, has not changed. It is important that we understand that Roman universal papal authority has not changed. You don't hear the priest saying too much about the things that we're talking about here, but they believe it. Francis believes it. Benedict XVI before him believed it. John Paul II before him believed it. Great controversy, page 581 in paragraph 2 says, Let it be remembered. It is the beast of Rome that she, it is the boast of Rome that she never changes. Let me read that sentence again for you. Great controversy, page 581 in paragraph 2. Let it be remembered. It is the boast of Rome that she never changes. The principles of Gregory the Seventh and Innocent the Third are still the principles of the Roman Catholic Church. And had she but the power, she would put them in practice with as much vigor now as in past centuries. Now I'm going to pause there today because I want you to absorb what we've been talking about here. Some of those things that these men have been saying about the papacy. And, and, and the, the, the situation where, where this particular little horn that came up at the time when the Roman Empire was dissolved into the ten kingdoms that we now know to be, to be, uh, to be Europe. And those ten kings were the Franks, the Albany, the Alamanni, the Lombards, the Suevi, the Anglo-Saxons, the Burgundians, the Visigoths, the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths, about the time when he came up. And he removed three of them, Heruli, Vandals, and Ostrogoths. And of course, perhaps what I should do before I close out today, just remind you of who those, those seven remaining are. The Franks are France. The Alamanni, Germany. The Lombards, Italy. The Suevi, Portugal. The Anglo-Saxons, England. The Burgundians, Switzerland. The Visigoths, Spain. They're still there. They're still there. And that is why you see the European Union today moving in the direction that it is because the papacy is already already taking control again with a healed wound in that part of the world. But you and I need to be ready for God in his kindness has warned us concerning all that is to take place. And in our very next session, we will continue to take a look at this subject. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your kindness. We thank you that you have warned us in advance of all that is coming to pass. We ask, Lord, that you would give us the strength that is necessary so that we will be willing to stand with you and for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This has been Morning Manna, May the 23rd, 2000. 21.